participating and for everyone for joining the conference. Um, I'm, um, and for all the questions from the audience. John is wrapping up, just so you know. And it, I encourage people to Hello? Hello, can people hear me? Hello? Mic is on. Yes, we can hear you. Fantastic. Well then, David, then I think we can start. <laughs> Great, thanks for responding. It is, um, I think I speak for everyone that um, the technology has been mildly challenging today. I hope we can um, get it to work perfectly for the rest of the conference. Um, I. Uh, I did want to um, thank everybody for, um, for coming. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the, the, the second of the two uh, pre-conference panel discussions as we prepare to officially launch the 2020 STD Prevention Conference. Um, our opening plenary officially will be uh, after the session at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So I'm uh, Dr. Jonathan Merman. I'm the director of the National Center for HIV Viral Hepatitis STD and TB prevention at CDC, and I'm privileged to moderate this session titled 
COVID-19 and SDI prevention. We will discuss how the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has transformed the state of STD prevention in the US, how it has challenged our programs, limited patient access to services, and shifted our staff. At the same time, we'll discuss how C19 has invigorated our creativity, questioned the need to do some aspects of STI care the way we have done them in the past, push the envelope of thoughtful safer sex guidance, telehealth and partner services, and encourage self-testing and sample collection. These are truly difficult times in many personal ways, not the least because of all of us have been affected by the COVID-19 virus, either by being ill ourselves, having friends or family hospitalized, or in some cases, losing loved ones. At the same time, our work lives are in crisis with many STD clinics and CBOs closed or with reduced services, health departments with hiring freezes and focused on COVID-19 and people concerned about losing their jobs. All the time when we're concerned that STDs were getting worse before January, what are they doing now? It is clear to most Americans during the pandemic that our public health system is fragmented and struggling. STD services have known this for years, and now our staff are vital to the C-19 epidemic response as well as STD prevention. And I think I speak for all of us that we hope that lessons learned from this crisis will lead to greater investments and in public health capacity in the future. So we have a number of panelists today who represent a range of backgrounds and experiences, and they will present the latest information on the virus itself, new national data on levels of STD testing and disease reporting, as well as data from sexual activity surveys that will provide an indication of how social distancing and stay-at-home orders may or may not have impacted levels of risk. They'll share practices in sexual health messaging and guidance, and they'll share personal experiences working on the front lines in places like New York City and St. Louis. For those of us who have lived and breathed STDs for the past few decades, there are moving similarities as well as differences with COVID-19. But for both epidemics, it is our job to use science, evidence, and experience to reduce infections, treat those affected, and eliminate the stark racial, ethnic, social, and economic inequities by helping the most affected get the, get the services that they deserve. So today, um, we are going to hear from a number of speakers. First, Dr. Uh, and Professor Jeannie Marazzo, who's Professor of Medicine and Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She also serves on the IDSA Board of Directors. In 2019, she became one of four co-investigators leading the Infectious Diseases Clinical Research Consortium, which is working on vaccines and therapeutic trials in infectious diseases, including SARS-CoV-2. We're also hearing from Dr. Hillard Weinstock, who's the Chief of the Surveillance and Data Management Branch in our Division of STD Prevention at CDC. He has over 25 years of experience at the state, local, and federal levels working in STD and HIV surveillance. And his branch is responsible for monitoring the burden and trends of STDs in the US. We're gonna hear from Dr. Katie Renfro, who recently joined the Social and Behavioral Research and Evaluation Branch in the Division of STD Prevention at CDC. She's a health scientist um, who uh, has been working in, in STDs for several years. Um, and she also has a PhD in behavioral neuroscience. Dr. Hillary Reno is an associate professor in infectious diseases at Washington University in St. Louis. She's medical director of the St. Louis County Sexual Health Clinic, and she's a medical consultant for the Division of STD Prevention. We hear from Dr. Susan Blank, who's worked in the field of STD prevention for over 25 years as a federal assignee to the New York City Department of Health, and the, she's run the largest STD program in the nation. There she served as the Bureau's director and as an assistant commissioner of health. And she led the Bureau through the thick of New York City's COVID epidemic this spring. We'll also hear from David Harvey, who joined the National Coalition of STD Directors as Executive Director in 2016. He's focused on repositioning the organization's program, communications, and policy work to fight rising STDs and to join in the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiatives from a syndemic perspective. NCSD is responding to COVID-19 by supporting contact tracing and documenting the impact of the pandemic on our nation's STD prevention and care network. And lastly, we'll hear from Dr. Julia Marcus, who's an infectious disease epidemiologist and assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and on the adjunct faculty at the Fenway Institute. And her research focuses on improving the implementation of PrEP in the US. She's been writing for the Atlantic on public health communication for COVID-19, including lessons learned about harm reduction from the HIV epidemic. And so now I'm gonna turn the slides and mic over to our first speaker. Okay, let me pull up my slides. They should have, oh, great, they're up. There Can they everybody are. hear me? 
We can. Yes. You can hear me. Okay. Thanks so much, Jono, for that kind introduction. And it's a really a pleasure to be here with such a, an esteemed group of people. Um, I am charged with a pretty impossible task, so I hope you won't judge me uh, too harshly. It's basically to give a very diverse audience uh, a very quick overview on the virus that causes uh, the disease named COVID-19, and that is SARS CoV-2. And so I'll just do that very quickly. I won't probably even take my 10 minutes, but let me just get started. So, and much of this is going to be familiar to all of you, so I apologize if it's duplicative, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page for this session. So, you probably know that coronaviruses in general are pretty common respiratory viruses. Um, they are RNA viruses. They're named for the fact that they have a sun-like corona appearance. And in fact, one of several species of coronavirus is the second most common cause of the common cold that you get every single winter. So these are viruses that like to land in and bind to epithelial cells in the upper respiratory tract, namely the nose and the throat, the oropharynx or the nasopharynx. And that picture here of the blue background is a picture of respiratory epithelium with the viruses adhering quite tightly to, um, to the epithelium there. Uh, did you guys just leave my slide? Okay, good, it's back. Um, it's interesting that the virus actually attaches to a receptor that is present throughout the body, but particularly in the, in the respiratory airways, and that's the ACE2 receptor. And some of you may know that ACE inhibitors are used to treat blood pressure, and some people get a cough uh, because of taking those medications, and that's exactly what is the mechanism of the cough that ACE inhibitors cause. The really scary thing about these viruses is that they're incredibly easily transmitted, primarily by respiratory droplets, although we'll come back and talk about that in a little bit more detail. But you can also, like any cold or virus cold, contaminate your hands, fomites, anything, and rub your face, rub your eyes, rub your nose, and inoculate yourself. That makes control very difficult, which we have seen very well. And there are some other famous coronaviruses, namely SARS and MERS. SARS, you all remember, I am sure, from not that long ago, and MERS is continuing to go on in the Middle East. And what's key about these viruses, in addition to the things that I just mentioned, is that animal reservoirs are really important. They're ubiquitous, particularly in mammals. And just a picture here of the civet cat, which was implicated in the SARS outbreak, and then, of course, the bat, which is many species of bat harbor many species of coronavirus. And one of the reasons we think the virus may have first shown up in Wuhan, China, was in association with a market that was selling animals, meat, wildlife, that sort of thing. And that may have been the source of how the virus got into the human transmission chain. In terms of clinical aspects, as I'm sure you've all heard, you know, we don't have any pre-existing protection in terms of antibody to this specific virus. We do, of course, have antibodies to coronavirus that we get every year that cause the common cold. The problem is that those antibodies are just not long lasting. That's why you get a cold every single year and sometimes you get more than one. It seems that they last probably for about three months, but we really don't even understand that much about it. Most people who get SARS-CoV-2 have pretty mild to moderate disease, and that's including mild respiratory symptoms all the way up to a mild pneumonia. And that scenario occurs most commonly in young, younger people. This is a virus that really favors young people. Pretty much the cutoff is about 60 to 60, 65. Unfortunately, some people will have severe disease, namely significant um, dyspnea, shortness of breath, low oxygen levels, or greater than half of their lungs involved when you do a CT scan or a chest X-ray, and that happens in about 14%. And then you have the minority of people who are critically ill, the people you've seen in some of the intensive care units with respiratory failure, shock, um, all the sorts of things that are really bad. And the people who tend to go that route are people who have underlying medical problems already, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, chronic lung disease, coronary artery disease, chronic kidney disease, being on dialysis, obesity, a major one, probably the biggest one that we see here uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, where we still have over 100 patients right now in the hospital with COVID. Um, and interestingly, smoking and increasingly vaping, uh, which is probably a risk factor in younger adults, not so good. We don't really know how many infections are 
truly asymptomatic. This has been a really uh, incredibly deep debate. Uh, we think it's probably between 20 to 40 percent. But the key thing, whatever that is, is that a major proportion of transmission comes from people who are asymptomatic. And again, that percentage has been debated a lot from Twitter to the national news to scientific journals, but it's probably about 20 to 30 percent. Some would pay, say it's higher. And you can recover the virus from people who have absolutely no symptoms. So speaking of recovering the virus, how do you do that? And there's a lot of confusion about how we diagnose SARS-CoV-2, and a lot of people arguing about what the best use is, uh, what the test best test to use is, especially if you're using it for screening. For example, sending kids back for sports. Huge debate. So there really are three categories of tests. I just want to make sure everybody knows. Um, first of all, there are the classic nucleic acid amplification tests, just like we use for chlamydia and gonorrhea and trichomonas. The primary clinical use for that test or those tests and there are a number of them, is to diagnose current infections. And that mainly means people who are symptomatic come in, they get a nasopharyngeal swab. Increasingly, we've been using just nasal swabs. Also, people are starting to use saliva. That's been a big advance, although there are some people who are not sure about the performance of that test. But these tests take anywhere from about 40 minutes, if you can get your hands on a rapid PCR test, which is increasingly difficult to do because of a shortage of reagents and laboratory platforms, which you're going to hear from people has affected our ability to diagnose STDs, um, or more commonly, it happens overnight and you get the result the next day. These are great performing tests, just like they are for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So you can really believe them for the most part. Antibodies, remember, are really problematic. Antibodies are probably formed at three to four weeks after your acute infection. And then how long they last probably differs for a lot of different people. On average, people think they may last around three to four months, but it's possible some people may last longer. We are telling people in our clinic that you can get reinfected after three months. And we and others have clearly seen reinfection in people who either had antibody and lost it or never made adequate antibody in the first place. And that's a huge issue, and we can talk about that if we have time. Um, and then the third category are antigen tests. So antigen tests, tests um, actually are good to diagnose current infection as well. They are most sensitive in people who are in the early symptomatic phase of the illness. So people are using the antigen tests for screening asymptomatic people, but we don't have a great idea of what the performance characteristics of those tests are. So that's a very, very brief survey through the categories. And again, we can come back to that if you want. Let me give you a kind of a timeline. This is from a very nice JAMA paper last June um, that is, not, um, is already a little bit out to date because we didn't really have antigen testing when this paper was written. And again, the pace of um, the fire hydrant flow of information with SARS-CoV-2 means that you'll never give the same talk twice or you'll never ask the same question twice, twice, even if you give it two days in a row. But this gives you a nice sense of what happens before symptom onset. What I want to point out is in blue and orange lines in particular and pink, you can see a very, very rapid increase in the quantity of the virus as measured by PCR. Whether you get it from the nasopharynx, um, whether you use a culture, which is obviously you can grow it, um, and even when you go down into the lungs to get it, although that probably happens a little bit later because the virus has to get down there. After about a week, you start to see the culture turn negative. So that's that orange line, which is why we say by 14 days, people are very likely not infectious, okay? So you can still detect it by PCR, often up to 21 days, and some people persistently, especially if they're immunocompromised. But in general, the culture becomes negative on average around eight to nine days. And in almost everybody, 99% of people by 14 days, that's where we get the recommendation for isolation of 10 days plus your asymptomatic days, and then quarantine for 14 days to help make sure that people don't transmit it. And then of course, antibodies turn positive generally around week three. 
and uh, maybe persist, although, as I said, we don't really know that. So where are we uh, epidemiologically um, in the United States? I updated these slides just yesterday. So these are from uh, graphics from the New York Times. And you can see that the incidence um, of the virus in terms of daily cases reported, and that is not a true incidence, and we can have a whole debate about the epidemiologic uh, measures of this virus. It's really complicated. The numbers I'm reporting, the numbers of tests done, um, what tests are being done, are point of care tests being reported now, how much is antibody. It's a complete and holy mess, um, to say the least. But let's just go with it and say, for now, that there clearly has been a shift of the virus from the West Coast to the entire East Coast, from the Northeast down to the Southeast, lots of disease in the Midwest, and unfortunately now more outbreaks in college campuses and recurrent outbreaks in cities in particular that had done a pretty good job controlling it, particularly in Southern California. So we're now on the lower left side, as I show here, at 6.5 million cases, um, on September 12th, there had been 39,000 cases yesterday. I think there were in the mid to high 30s. And today I just saw worldwide that we have one of the highest case counts reported um, in the recent months. So I do not think, despite the 14-day change that we are seeing in number of reported cases in the U.S. of 18 percent, that that is really cause for complacency because, again, there's so many variables uh, with these numbers. I think better numbers are probably positivity, um, and we can talk about that if we have a little bit of time. Well, I want to finish by talking about a couple of things, transmission, prevention, and then I'll very quickly mention treatment. Again, a lot of debate about how this is transmitted. And if you understand anything about transmission of respiratory viruses, it's kind of helpful to understand that there is a spectrum of the size of things that come out of your nose or out of your mouth when you cough or sneeze, right? And you know this, sometimes you sneeze and it's like massive objects try to come out, which is not very nice. Other times you sneeze and it's a very fine spray. And that's essentially the spectrum of droplet transmission and airborne transmission, okay? So heavy, wet droplets are droplet transmission, as you get down into these very small five micrometer sort of things, you're getting into what we call airborne transmission. And so the spectrum of how this virus is transmitted really depends on the amount of virus in the person's body, the propulsive force that they are either breathing with, coughing with, or sneezing with, and critically, two other things, whether you have a mask in front of your face or a face shield, or how far you are away. And the six feet metric that we use is just a doubling of the average place that most quote unquote uh, droplet uh, born um, uh, trajectories actually fall out. So all of those things are, are listed there. You can imagine that airflow makes a big difference if you're outside and there's a fresh breeze versus being in a five by five foot room with somebody, it's gonna make a big difference. If you're crowding and also Crowding, remember, not just increases the likelihood of, of, of respiratory transmission, but increases the likelihood you're going to touch contaminated surfaces. So bars are a great example of, um, of, of just a complete hothouse uh, for transmitting this. And we're seeing this, of course, as kids go back to college campuses, unfortunately. So all of those things inform the three main measures that we are using, which are social distancing, hand hygiene, and masks. So not too surprising, I think. So let me just finish up by mentioning sexual transmission. Um, and you're going to hear a lot more about this and a lot more discussion um, in, in this session. Um, obviously, people do more than transmit genital fluids when they have sex, right? There's saliva and sputum, and they're obvious potential sources, given that these are viruses that like the respiratory tract, the oropharynx and the nasopharynx. So clearly, there's no question that if you do that, you're going to be putting people at risk for acquisition. I think the thing that people are often interested in too is can you, even if you don't do any contact facially, either you wear a mask or you really don't even see the person, um, that's a whole other story, um, can you find it in semen or vaginal fluid? And I would say the jury is still out. In semen, um, 
there are conflicting find, findings, but there was a recent cohort study I mentioned here that showed the minority of men did have virus in the semen. Four of them were in the acute phase of illness. Um, and we do know that the ACE2 receptor, which does bind this virus, is highly expressed in, testicle, uh, in the testicles, which is kind of interesting. Uh, vaginal fluid, very small studies, uh, it does not appear to be detected, at least in this tiny study. So I would say the jury is still out. So just a reminder for prevention and treatment, let's talk about that. This is the basis for what we are doing in the hospital and what we are doing globally but maybe we should also add our favorite uh, barrier methods to the mix just to be totally sure. So let's just cover very quickly biomedical prevention and then I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Merman. I think of this in three big buckets. There's active immunization, vaccines. There's chemoprophylaxis, which is PrEP or PEP, which this audience is very familiar with. And then there's passive immunization, which is monoclonal antibodies, but also convalescent plasma, which we have still not um, totally ruled out yet. So let's just very briefly remind people, I, I cannot in, in two minutes do justice to the state of the vaccine field, but I will refer you to a couple of nice um, overviews and updates, a very nice overview by Nicole Lurie uh, and colleagues in the New England Journal early, earlier this year that covered the fact that there are really interesting platforms being used to develop the SARS CoV-2 vaccines that are under study right now. The Moderna trial in particular, which now has enrolled over 30, sorry, 25,000 people about, um, is using a messenger RNA platform. And that basically means you pump out tons of messenger RNA, you package it in a structure so that it's not destroyed when you inject it into somebody. It goes into the cell and instructs your cells to make lots of proteins that are then targets for antibody that theoretically prevent against virus acquisition. There has never been a messenger RNA vaccine um, in um, licensed or used. So this is really new territory. So really important that we get this right and understand what these vaccines look like. You've probably heard that the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is a different construct, that's an adenovirus that has some viral genome incorporated into it was halted briefly last week because of an episode of uh, transverse myelitis, which is a spinal cord inflammation. The study was resumed this weekend. So um, hopefully that is going to be either an unrelated or a very rare illness. But we do know that viruses cause that illness rarely. So who knows what that's gonna turn out to be. I'd also encourage you to check out the New York Times coronavirus vaccine tracker. Changed a lot in the last, like literally, couple of weeks, um, you'll see that a lot fewer uh, vaccines are actually now in phase one. And you can see um, that we're moving to about nine now in large scale efficacy tests. So um, exciting time, uh, a lot to learn. And, um, you know, when will we hear about a vaccine? My prediction is probably sometime in the spring. Um, maybe, um, maybe a little bit later, but um, really hopeful. One other thing I should say is that People, uh, particularly in the um, NIH-funded infection uh, consortium, are really committed to moving these trials to pregnant women, breastfeeding women, and also kids. And there was just an ethical consultation at NIH that discussed how to um, phase pediatric vaccine trials in as soon as possible. And I think um, there's really a strong commitment as vaccines to do that. So um, I will stop there with one of my favorite um, Albert Einstein quotes, and uh, I think it has never been more true than it is at this time. So I'll turn it back to you, uh, John O. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Marissa. Um I'm now going to um, turn over the mic and screen to our next two speakers, um, Drs. Uh, Renfro and Weinstock, who will be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on sexual behavior and STD incidents. Hear me? We can. Wonderful. Okay. And with around uh, seven allotted minutes, I'm going to attempt to cut some of my typical long-winded preambular verbiage and just dive right in. So today I'm going to be talking about the corner of COVID work that's focused on the relationship between COVID-19 and sexual behavior. 
And as we all might readily recognize, uh, there are features of paired sexual activity, some might even call these hallmark features, that make it a cause for concern for COVID transmission. So beyond transmission via sexual fluids, as Dr. Marazzo uh, touched on, there's just realities of being within close proximity to another person, often though I suppose not always being indoors with that person and so on. And perhaps because of this widespread recognition from early on in the pandemic, there's been a lot of interest in how uh, the relationship between COVID and sex and specifically how some of uh, the mitigation efforts such as physical distancing might affect overall incidence of sexual behavior and then how those effects might work in concert with or in opposition to other consequences of the pandemic such as job loss, loneliness, or even just um, simple truths that some of us face of being home a lot more with a lot less to do. And this interest has been reflected in heavy media coverage of such questions and then in speculation and citation of expert opinion on answers to those questions and in turn translation of those answers into prescriptions. But the question remains of what did the data show? Now to begin to address this, I wanna start with talking about where the data are. So what you'll see here um, highlighted in a color that I'm told is thistle are countries for which I was able to locate data-driven preprints or articles and the value of the color corresponding to how many articles were coming out of those countries. Now, all told, it's about 20 articles spanning about a dozen countries. Um, and I wanna emphasize at that outset here that this is what the best of my literature searching revealed about up until a week ago. It's of course possible, if not probable, that I missed something at that time. And uh, what's certainly the case if, is that if something hasn't come out in the interim, it is sure to come out soon. So as this is rapidly evolving, of course, our um, conclusions and takeaways will evolve with the data. And I also want to note that um, I encourage everyone to go read all of this work, but that for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus on those papers, which included measures of number of sexual partners, as well as frequency of sexual behavior, with an emphasis on those that include proportions of the samples that are reporting changes in those endpoints. And for digestibility purposes, I collected data across the papers and put them onto shared axes. But I also want to note that um, this was not; these were not conducted across the studies with some sort of shared instrument or um, or like unified question or anything like that. And um, that's not a prefacing, and I'm not sure it's commensurate with the level of added clarity. So how about I just jump into the data and we can talk about what they say. Well, with regard to number of sexual partners, so what you're seeing here along the y-axis is the study from which the data are derived. And what you see in the asterisk is indicating that that study has not yet been peer reviewed. And in the parenthetical is if it focused on a specific population. So what we find is that from around 40% to 75% of the sample, uh, dependent on the study, are reporting that they've decreased their number of sexual partners during COVID. Now, we should note that a lot of these studies that I'm showing here were focused on samples of men who have sex with men, but I will say that uh, these are reflected in relatively consistent data by Lee and colleagues that focused on a largely heterosexual sample and are also coherent with some of the data coming out of largely heterosexual samples about uh, things like casual sex and sex-seeking behavior. Now, of course, there's another way to frame these data, which would be to say that there are sizable portions who are not reporting that they're decreasing their number of sexual partners. And this is anchored by some recent data that's coming out from Stevenson and colleagues, where they actually asked a sample of MSM in the U.S., how important do you think it is to decrease your number of sexual partners during COVID? They were able to answer on a scale from one to five, one being not all important, five being extremely important. And in general, they were saying really not so important. So that's all to say that there are certainly nuance in these data that, as there is with research in general, that warrant uh, further investigation. Now, when we look at the frequency of sexual behaviors, you see data that are somewhat consistent with those partner numbers in that you have many reporting decreases in their frequency. There is quite a bit more variability across the studies. So ranging from anywhere from around 14% of the sample reporting that to about 87% of the sample. And as you can probably readily recognize, there are large portions who are reporting no change whatsoever. 
Um, but I want to focus to sort of cut through some of this complexity here on those who are reporting a change. And when we look at this, we see a more consistent story in that across all of the studies that I was able to locate here, um, when someone was reporting a change in their, or when the population was reporting a change in their sexual behavior, in no case was a larger proportion of that population reporting an in increase than was reporting a decrease. Now, to tie this back in with uh, the partner number data, when asked about what types of sexual activity people were engaging in, uh, they do report that they are still engaging in some casual sex and to a lesser extent, some group sex. But what's important to note is that of those who are continuing to engage in these behaviors, many are saying that they're doing so less frequently. And there are portions of those samples who are saying that they stopped altogether or are avoiding it. Now, across these studies, they've looked at what uh, factors are related to, and in some cases, predictive of partner number and increased engagement in sexual activity. And what you find with those factors is they include things such as age, sex, gender, relationship status, drug, alcohol use, as well as um, many factors of mental state. And what's shown here is with the up arrow indicating a direct relationship, down, into, down arrow indicating inverse relationship. And there's also been a lot of interest in, of those who are continuing to meet partners, how are they doing so? So we have some data from the um, from dating apps through corporate releases, as well as media reports that were showing that early on you were seeing increases in engagement with these platforms. For example, Tinder noted that they had their day of highest engagement in their entire history. But these data are not completely consistent with some of the self-report data that we're seeing released, where people are saying that their app usage is actually down. I'm sure temporal dynamics have something to do with that, wherein people are maybe using them less as the pandemic goes along. Um, but where we see convergence between the self-report data and the uh, corporate data are people are saying that when they are using them, some of them are using them in novel ways. So for example, virtual dating and app video messaging and so on and so forth. Now, as in step with uh, the nature of dating changes, there are also changes in the nature of sex that people are having. So um, unfortunately, seeing decreases in quality of sex, this would include things like sexual satisfaction. Um, we're also seeing that some people are adding new acts to their sexual repertoire, as well as uh, changes in solo sexual behavior. So as partnered sexual behavior has gone down, we've seen a corresponding increase in reports of things like masturbation, as well as engagement with what some might call sexual technologies. And these would be things like sex toys and pornography, where you're seeing increased engagement as well as changes in the behaviors corresponding to those. Now, of course, as mentioned, all of this work is ongoing and so, I'm sure I look forward to the future developments, as well as in the work cited here, there are studies that have yet to release data that I'm sure will help complement and add to what's already come out. Of course, the implications of these data are relatively wide ranging. People have talked about what this means for interpersonal relationships, uh, but perhaps most germane to the present panel is what it means for incidents of sexually transmitted infections. And Dr. Weinstock, in just a moment, is going to uh, give us great data on STI incidents within the US. These data are derived from some work out of the UK where they saw PET prescriptions immediately following shelter in place orders were down 80%. And then they were actually able to leverage these data to create outreach campaigns, sort of capitalizing on maybe this uh, sad reality for some have been going solo recently, now's the time to test. Lockdown has broken the HIV chain saying, that because of COVID-19, HIV transmissions are down. So this is the time to test, get on prep, and so on. Uh, so maybe in that more hopeful note, I'll conclude and happy to answer questions after this and feel free to contact me should there be anything that arises after. Thanks. Great. Hello, are your slides coming up? Perfect. Yes. Um, let's see if I can get my. Oh, oh, there I am. Okay. Um, I don't see my slides. Are they still showing? Can you can you see my slides? I cannot see your slide. There they are. They're up now. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Why? Well, um, 
Uh, thanks. I'd like to first thank my co-authors who did most of the work in helping me put this presentation together. So for the past several years, SDDs reported the CDC from state health departments, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis have been increasing. This shows increases in chlamydia for the past 10 years, uh, including 2019 data, which are still not complete. Gonorrhea has increased among men and women since 2014. Primary and secondary syphilis in women has increased since 2013. Rates among men, predominantly men who have sex with men, have increased since 2001. In early 2020, as COVID-19 emerged in the U.S., more than half the population came under stay-at-home orders through late May. These data were compiled by Dr. Jeremy Gray with data from the Kaiser Family Foundation, the National Academy for State Health Policy, and the New York Times. In the face of these stay-at-home orders, despite the increases in all notifiable STDs that we had been seeing, we expected to see decreases in case rates due to COVID-19. There were potential decreases in reporting itself, with shifting local and state health department resources to the COVID-19 effort, potential decreases in testing and screening with the closing of clinics or limited services, and possibly decreases in incident infections due to social distancing. Teasing out these different factors is difficult. We started by looking at the numbers reported to CDC. This slide shows reported cases in 2020 as a percentage of cases reported during the same time period in 2019 for gonorrhea in orange, primary and secondary syphilis in light blue, and chlamydia in dark blue through the end of June of this year. As you can see for the first part of 2020, the number of reported cases for all three conditions was the same or greater than what was reported in 2019. Beginning in early March, there was a steep decline in reported cases as a percent of what was reported last year. And then in mid-April, reported cases began to slowly increase as a percentage of what was reported last year. In June for syphilis, the 2020 numbers were higher than what was reported for syphilis in June of 2019. We looked at these data in a number of ways. We did not see differences by sex for any of these three conditions or by age group. We tried to look at this by race ethnicity and did not see any clear differences. For chlamydia and gonorrhea in the top graphs, 2020 reports from Asians in the purple line may have been somewhat lower as a percentage of reports from Asians in 2019 compared to other racial ethnic groups. We did not see clear differences by diagnosing facility. The red line reflects reports from STD clinics, new private providers, and yellow other or unknown provider types. We looked at these data by disease and by census region, and we did see, and we did see some differences. In particular, there was less reported data from the Northeast, shown here in the teal colored line, which was more impacted by COVID-19 early in the U.S. pandemic than other regions of the country. We saw this for all three notifiable conditions, and this decrease has persisted. Since STD case rates were increasing at the time that COVID-19 emerged, we tried to take this into account in an effort to quantify the decrease in reporting. On this graph, the dotted line shows a midpoint estimate of the number of gonorrhea cases we would have expected to be reported by month if trends observed in 2019 had continued uninterrupted. We modeled the projected number of cases based on a log linear analysis of cases between January 2019 and January 2020 and projected that through June of 2020. The bars show the actual number of cases reported by month. You can see a marked decrease in reported cases beginning in March of 2020. 
We estimated the potential case deficit due to COVID-19, which was at a minimum in February, with cases roughly equal to what would have been expected based on last year's trends. For gonorrhea, for example, shown here, the impact on reported cases was most pronounced in April, with a deficit of approximately 27,000 fewer cases reported that month than what we would have expected if trends from 2019 had not been interrupted. We looked at this by month for chlamydia and syphilis as well. And while these case deficits have generally declined by month for each condition, there remains in total markedly fewer cases reported so far this year than what would have been expected for each condition. There are a number of limitations and caveats to this work. Importantly, the evaluation we conducted of what's happening in 2020 is based on a comparison with 2019 data, which in itself is incomplete. Several states have not yet been able to submit complete data for 2019. Thus, the case deficits we describe here are most likely underestimates of what would have been expected had the COVID-19 pandemic not occurred. Finally, this is an evolving situation. The COVID-19 pandemic is obviously not over and its impact on STDs and STD reporting in the US will undoubtedly continue to change. In conclusion, we saw substantial decreases in STD reporting. However, our data do not explain how and to what degree multiple factors probably contributed to these declines. Evidence exists, for example, that there were decreases in testing due to reduced availability of healthcare services. In this analysis by Goyu Tao and Tom Gift at CDC, using data from a large commercial laboratory, comparing the number of chlamydia tests performed in 2020 in orange to 2019 numbers in blue, you can see that around week 10, the week of March 13th, chlamydia tests dramatically decreased, but then gradually returned to near 2019 levels by week 27 which is the first week of July. As discussed in the pre previous presentation, there is evidence that sexual behaviors may have decreased, and this may have impacted the incidence of STDs. Finally, as health department staff have been deployed to work on COVID-19 related <laughs> activities, we know there have been delays in health department processing and reporting of cases. Hopefully, these cases can eventually be processed and reported. But despite the declines observed in reporting of STDs in the early part of this year, we are seeing recent increases in syphilis and gonorrhea up to and above 2019 levels. While some of these additional cases may reflect backlog for previous months, they also suggest that the increases we observed prior to the COVID-19 pandemic may still be with us. Thank you. I'll turn it back to Jono. Great, thank you very much, Hillary. And I think um, uh, your discussion goes very nicely into the next two speakers, uh, Drs. Blank and Reno, who will talk about the impact of COVID-19 on STD services, and maybe they'll be able to tease out some of the issues that you've highlighted. Um, I think the first speaker will be Dr. Blank. Okay, just getting my slides. They're on. They are? Ah. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am gonna be talking about the local impact of COVID-19. I wanna begin though, um, by telling you a little bit about the situation in New York City. Um, while New York City has done a remarkable job in bending the curve downward in new HIV diagnoses, we nevertheless, um, as other places have, experienced years of persistent increases in bacterial STI. These increases have been primarily among men, but have also included women. And most notably, we've seen increases in primary and secondary syphilis among women with concomitant increases in congenital syphilis. Switching over to COVID, New York City was a very early epicenter for COVID. Here you see the confirmed numbers of COVID cases in the bars and COVID deaths with the black line in New York City from February through August of this year, 
with some key dates superimposed that I'll walk you through. From March 22nd to June 8th, New York went on pause, is the phrase that was used, with governor's orders to stay at home, to close schools and non-essential businesses, and to cancel all non-essential cares, like elective surgeries and routine in-person care, in order to make room for COVID patients and to preserve personal protective equipment. New York State designated certain essential services, though, that could not be interrupted for face-to-face -face, um, care. That included prenatal care, HIV care, and cancer care, among others. The governor also enabled and promoted the use of telemedicine to lessen the burden for in-person care. And in mid-April, there was a universal masking in public requirement um, that you see noted on the, on the chart. So you can see that over time, we've made amazing progress against COVID. But what you can't see on this chart is the traumatic toll on not only the Bureau of STI staff and the health department and New Yorkers in general, we lost our colleagues and our loved ones um, and, and faced emotional and financial stressors while keeping the public health response afloat. So in terms of thinking about the impact on STI services, I think there I think I'm going to I'm going to talk about two kinds of buckets of impact. The first you'll see on the left. With the increases in COVID cases, actually even before we saw COVID cases in January, the health department had scaled up its incident command system and was at that point already diverting BSTI staff assets and capacity for us to do our work in STI. In March was when the city went on pause and had stay at home orders and there were documented decreases in volumes of patients seeking routine health care by any means. But in challenging times, New Yorkers pivot. Um, in order to explain the pivot, I'm going to talk about some enablers that gave us some solid footing for the pivot. One is that we started with a robust STI surveillance system that includes mandated uh, electronic reporting from laboratories for over 10 years. We had a written pandemic plan for continuity of STI services. The agency and the Bureau have extensive communication networks with, provide, with over 50,000 providers, labs, and um, through multimedia with the general public. We have productive partnerships with a variety of groups that you can see listed here, um, in, including other jurisdictions. Um, and we have had recently, just prior to COVID, had some significant policy and legislative changes uh, around STI prevention which include that New York City had just mandated third trimester syphilis screening and New York State had just expanded expedited partner therapy beyond chlamydia to include gonorrhea and trichomonas. So let's talk about the pivot. The first thing I'm gonna tell you about is surveillance. Um, as we often do, we reprioritized our case investigations. Of course, we had less staff um, and as we are, are uh, we tend to do, we kept our focus on uh, congenital syphilis prevention by aggressively following up on women reactors of childbearing age. As far as the safety net services that we deliver at the New York City uh, Sexual Health Clinics, we shifted safety net service access from walk-in clinic-based access to telemedicine access. We developed telemedicine protocols. We brought in the hardware to make it possible and um, used uh, telephonic history and syndromic management, electronic prescribing, and when necessary, referral. For our patients who, couldn't, who did not have pharmacy uh, prescription access, we worked with interagency partners to, and contracted with a pharmacy to actually deliver medications to, the, to homes of patients at no charge to them, along with free oral HIV tests. We also augmented our telemedicine services with limited in-person services to provide emergent sexual health care for those at highest risk of complications. We did this through decreasing, first we had to decrease our locations because we had limitations on the amount of uh, PPE we'd be able to use. So we went from eight clinics to the use of one clinic. And the services that we were providing both for telephone referral or for walk-in in this case was HIV PEP, emergency contraception, HIV treatment initiation, 
syphilis or acute HIV evaluations, as well as, again, any referrals from telemedicine for things such as injectable treatment. Um, with our, at our one of eight sites, we had to assure adequate staff, adequate PPE and distancing and securing business access. And we had to put screening visits aside for the time being. The second thing we did was work with providers across the city, disseminating similar pandemic uh, STI syndromic treatment guidelines to providers through our, our email network and um, through webinars. And we also worked to assure the availability of the oral antibiotics we were recommending in, co in commercial pharmacies. Around this time, this was when azithromycin was being hotly touted in the news. So we didn't wanna make recommendations that couldn't be followed through. We also worked with Rachel Malloy and our colleagues at New York State Department of Health to explore policies that would help us address barriers to care, such as expanding the pharmacist as immunizer laws to include injectable cephalosporins, to expand expedited partner therapy during COVID to include doxy for syphilis, although we did not follow through with that, and to enable home, home, a home testing pilot for STIs. And then lastly, um, we really um, put, a lot, put quite a bit of effort into sex positive public health messaging. We garnered much earned media for that messaging, but you're going to hear more about this in Julia Marcus's presentation to follow up. So the COVID situation has improved, and it's, but it's not over. So now what? Here you can see that um, the health department, despite the d declines in COVID, remains fully activated. We are concerned about resurgences. We are preparing for both flu season and vaccine. And that means continued diversion of uh, Bureau of STI staff, assets, and capacity. On the other hand, in New York City, New York City is off pause and it has been coming back to life via some tightly controlled phasing in. So New Yorkers do ha now have at this point a variety of pent up needs, including STI and other sexual health services. So we have STI and related needs increasing while our effective available resources are decreasing. So for now, it's been really continued patchwork for us. We have very limited capacity to resume usual BSTI activities. We um, are continuing to pursue innovative policies to enable access, um, and we are keeping providers, CBOs, and the public consistently informed with good, bad, or no news. And we are at the point where we really need to address to what degree and to how well our patches have worked. In the longer term, I think we need to pivot again from emergency uh, patches to sustainable practice. I think um, what's ahead is that we need to brace for long-term losses for STI prevention and control in terms of funding, in terms of staffing, particularly loss to deployment, loss to COVID, and um, some serious impending layoffs here in New York City, and the protracted loose, use loss of other resources. The other thing to brace for is really just losses in actionable data. With the backdrop of STI increases, really how much disease went un unmeasured because of lack of testing, syndromic treatment, or the use of EPT, and how much disease was propagated in the interim? What is our tolerance for the loss of disease intelligence? Should we be developing new systems of measurement or just frankly new measurements of our progress? And uh, we also need to develop just longer term plans and strategies for managing sustained lo losses because COVID's not going to be going away anytime soon. I think it, it's really a, 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 a warning sign that we need to assess our big picture priorities and plan sustainable, realistic and equitable programs that incorporate our lessons learned and systems um, put in place and resources that are emerging from the COVID response. And I think we need to practice accordingly and uh, regularly evaluate and reevaluate. I really wanna thank the, the um, passionate and talented individuals and organizations that helped me out. And I, I'm ready to pass off the mic to the next person. Hillary. Okay, I'm pulling up my slides.
Well, just jump to the end of my talk. All right. So we're going to talk about what we saw in St. Louis, Missouri. And the first thing I want to do is to give an overview of our region. So the St. Louis region consists of the city of St. Louis, St. Louis County, as well as surrounding counties in Missouri and Illinois. And the region has about 2.8 million people. We have a coalition of STD and HIV clinicians that started in 2015. And through that coalition, which consists of health departments, CBOs, healthcare systems, and other organizations, we know that we have 128 sites that offer HIV and STI testing. These sites do include health departments and the traditional STD clinics, of which there are a few in our region, as well as these community-based organizations, federally qualified health centers, and school-based clinics that do a lot of STI testing. Because we already have this list, and we knew, based on our work in the clinics, that patients were finding some of these services were altered because of COVID-19. When COVID-19 stay-at-home orders hit, we were able to map and determine the impact on those clinical systems. This is a map of the St. Louis region zoomed in on St. Louis city and county that you see outlined with the black line. All testing sites are labeled with a circle. Red represents a testing site that closed completely. Yellow represents one that modified its services, for example, it reduced its hours or the days it was open. Perhaps it had been a walk-in clinic but then became an appointment-only clinic. And then the green represents the 8% of clinics and testing sites that were not affected. So you can see a lot of red and yellow there, right? 28% of our testing sites closed completely. And 63% of them had modified services during the height of the stay-at-home orders. We were also able to look at the condom distribution sites and map those as well. So the condom distribution sites are managed by the city of St. Louis Health Department. And I labeled each of them with a star. So you have either red, yellow, or green, like we did on the previous slide. And then you'll notice that 43% of the condom distribution sites were closed. Certainly a higher percentage than the testing sites. But that means and really reflects the fact that a lot of these kind of distribution sites are in bars, restaurants, clubs, barbershops, businesses that were directly affected by the COVID-19 closure. And then you'll note 36% of the sites also had modified access. I would like to point out that though many of these businesses are reopened, their access has decidedly been modified and continues to be even now out of our stay-at-home orders. We were also interested in looking at testing volume. So because our region has a number of large healthcare systems, one of which is BJC Healthcare, we were able to use their EMR to look at testing volume for gonorrhea and chlamydia. BJC Healthcare itself consists of 15 hospitals in the St. Louis metro region and over 100 outpatient clinics. Using our EMR, we were able to total the tests for gonorrhea and chlamydia per week. This graph shows you from January 1st through July 1st. And you'll note that we marked where the first case of COVID was found in our region at the beginning of March through the lifting of the stay at home orders which was at the beginning of May. The total decrease in testing in the BJC healthcare system for gonorrhea and chlamydia was 45%. We looked at this data, much like Dr. Weinstock looked at the surveillance data by age group, gender groups, and racial groups, and found no significant differences in those groups in the testing volumes. I just pulled an example, women here their testing is noted in orange, men in blue, and the decreases in testing, though women obviously make up most of the volume of testing, was equal, 45 and 43%. We also did, were able to look at clinical venue within the BJC system. So orange line marks outpatient clinical testing. So this would be primary care clinics. 
The gray line marks, marks emergency departments. Emergency departments in St. Louis play a pivotal role in STD care. And in the city of St. Louis, our one main emergency department diagnoses at least 8% of the gonorrhea, chlamydia, and city residents. And then blue represents the inpatient testing. So you can see that outpatient clinical testing decreased 50% during the height of the stay-at-home orders and 34% in the emergency departments. Just so you know, we did look at this with HIV testing total. We saw a similar decrease in testing during that time with the COVID impact of 43%. Remember, gonorrhea chlamydia testing decreased 45% during that time. And we saw a similar impact on outpatient settings for their HIV tests, but a lower impact on emergency department testing, 12% decrease in the EDs during this time. We did not see an effect by age group, gender group, or racial group. The decrease in the emergency department testing is probably less so if for HIV because we have an expanded testing initiative for HIV testing and many emergency rooms do universal screening. So overall, what we saw of the impact of COVID-19 on testing in St. Louis is that closures and modified hours of, of access to STI and HIV testing sites were widespread in our region. We noted a decreased volume of testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia as well as HIV across age groups, racial groups, and gender groups, and then also in various clinical settings. Over the 10 weeks in which the, the stay-at-home orders and the first COVID test had an impact, we estimate there was approximately 4,400 gonorrhea and chlamydia tests that were missed and about 5,000 HIV tests. Our recovery is ongoing. Though the testing volume has returned to our pre-COVID volumes, we know, like I said, that there's still an impact on closures and modified hours. Though many of our STI and HIV test sites are beginning and continuing to use things like express testing and partnerships, um, as well as telehealth, we know that there's still an impact. I'd like to thank the Institute for Public Health at WashU for data management, Laura Marks, one of our ID fellows, that's a whiz at EMR data, and then our health departments. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Reno. Um, I'm now going to uh, turn over the mic and slides to David Harvey from NCSD, who's going to talk about contact tracing during COVID. And um, just to mention to, to uh, David and the, the speaker right after Julia Marcus that we have about 23 minutes left um, with our session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Let me load my slides. And they went to the end. Hold on. So uh, welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure to join you this afternoon. Um, it's an honor to be with uh, my, my colleagues today in presenting you some really some very interesting data on what's going on, broadly speaking, in our field related to the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the STD field. Uh, we're going to zoom out a little bit at this point and focus at the 60,000 foot level to talk about some of the macro level policy and program forces that are impacting on public health departments uh, across the country. And it and I don't have to tell all of you today that we face a very complicated scenario, not only related to getting the resources needed uh, to confront rising STDs, uh, but to also uh, uh, deal with the impact of COVID on our field. So I'm going to start out giving you a little background on the, on the work that NCSC has been doing. I'm going to breeze through um, some uh, slides and data that we have assembled in terms of the impact of COVID on public health departments, and, uh, and then get uh, a little bit into implications and discussion items, which I hope will generate some questions uh, towards the end. There is a slide for those of you who are down, downloading these slides uh, full of helpful resources uh, related to the topics at hand. So really, uh, in terms of the background discussion that I wanted to open with today, there were really kind of five points I think I want to leave you, leave you with. Prior to COVID, um, we all know that we have had a public health system in distress. Um, NCSD turned on a dime at the beginning of the pandemic once we all 
once our once our entire team got settled at home, uh, and we set about documenting the impact uh, on uh, our field, as well as providing assistance through um, expert consultations, information exchange, um, and we did initial work uh, to design with ASTO, uh, one of the first national online contact tracing um, training programs for entry level case investigators. Very early on, we sought uh, the national stage in the media to help educate the American public about what contact tracing actually is. And uh, we had a major impact uh, within the media and we wanted to tell not only the story of contact tracing, but the story of the STD's field, decades long experience in conducting this essential public health uh, tool. While we were very successful at that, we're also very aware that we may be creating some dilemmas as well, because I think as we all know, state health departments have been put in very tough situations in terms of lending their expertise around contact tracing, particularly from the STD, HIV, TB um, divisions within health departments, uh, but that also placed a huge burden on many of our people across the country uh, to be uh, uh, providing support for these efforts when they were already dealing with a situation of not enough resources. The next thing that we wanted to do was to really uh, document innovations in our field. That is an ongoing effort. Uh, we've heard about some of those in innovations already in the presentations today. And I think we all have a responsibility to be thinking very hard about how to make some of these innovations uh, at at-home testing, telehealth, express clinics, a permanent part of our field. And then last but not least, we wanted to use the experience we were gaining of learning from our uh, folks across the country uh, and contribute that experience to public policy work, joining with other national public health organizations in arguing for national policy, uh, a national plan and the resources needed by public health departments to not only make up for the, gra for, for the decades of not being funded adequately enough, but also uh, what was needed to adequately respond, uh, particularly around contact tracing. So early on, we set about doing a couple of uh, national surveys and none of these responses are gonna surprise anybody, but in the public policy and the programmatic work we world, we wanted to document very carefully uh, what was happening uh, within the system. So of 65 lead jurisdictions, that constitute the membership of NCSD. These are the states, six cities, US territories um, that are funded by CDC under the STD uh, prevention program. Uh, we really sought about uh, surveying, the, surveying them and getting information from them in great detail. And we did not just rely on sending out a survey monkey tool. Uh, our team did heroic work to track everybody down on the phone in very difficult times when nobody had a minute to to respond to a survey and get very important information on what was happening um, at the state and local level. Um, secondarily and third wise, we also surveyed disease intervention specialists directly, and we also surveyed um, STD clinics directly uh, across the country. The response rates were a little bit less in those uh, surveys. We very much were focusing on um, the state and the local, um, the territorial, uh, health departments uh, in, in, in getting data. Uh, but the first phase, we, we got it out the door early on in March. We did a second phase in June. Um, and then we, um, as I already indicated, relied a lot on contacting people by phone. The first phase of the results showed, as you can see here with this data, widespread disruption um, in services and, and, and our classic STD health department um, functions of DIS um, and screening. And as you can see here, uh, a huge number of clinics across the, the, the US were um, either closed their doors or severely uh, disrupted in the services that they were uh, providing. It's very interesting to compare kind of what was happening here with some of the earlier data we just saw presented on sexual behaviors and screening behaviors, and then of course, uh, how that is reflected um, in reporting. 
Uh, DIS, widely uh, deployed uh, uh, initially to respond to the contact tracing uh, needs of a COVID response. Um, and as a result, their STD work was widely disrupted. That's carried through for our second phase of the survey, um, which, show, which showed uh, continuing disruptions, but an also evolving situation over time where increasingly STD directors were asked to contribute their expertise around contact tracing. But we also saw, we also started to see health departments respond in different ways, um, either subcontracting those functions out because it just wasn't feasible to run these programs within the health departments or um, a wholesale uh, uh, redeployment of staff, which is already, which is still in place in many jurisdictions uh, who are doing this work. So absent a very strong national standard for how a contact tracing program should work coupled with testing, and we all know about the problems related to COVID testing, uh, we have had uh, each jurisdiction pursuing their own plans and strategies, um, which is highly variable as you move across the country. And it's very tough in terms of soliciting data um, uniformly uh, for a snapshot of what's happening across the country. Again, this uh, phase two data shows um, the disruptions that have happened to DIS. Um, and then uh, what we also see is that uh, most programs uh, to this date are continuing to rely not on in-person uh, work, but using technology, phone and text uh, to, to reach people, raising very interesting, important questions about online uh, partner services in the context of DIS. Innovations uh, that we've already heard a little bit uh, discussed today, uh, we asked programs to comment on. And as you can see, uh, one of the top uh, responses has been around the issue of at-home uh, self-collection STI testing programs, which NCSD is very engaged with trying to support. Um, we also see uh, telehealth being the top response, express visits, um, and mail order condom distribution programs, which is also an interesting uh, development. So implications and discussion items. Um, again, as I've already referenced, um, how do we best as a field support uh, the innovations that are now happening within our field post COVID-19. This is going to be an enormous issue for continuing uh, training and technical assistance efforts, as well as documenting what is happening uh, in the field. Um, I referenced uh, the fragmented nature of contact tracing responses throughout the country. Um, as we go forward in the coming months, um, despite the allocation of huge new resources to our field through the ELC program at CDC, those resources in many cases are not necessarily making their way directly to STD, HIV, TB, HEP programs that have traditionally taken the lead on contact tracing programs. Uh, these, these programs uh, are being uh, uh, structured and supported in a vast array of differences across the states. Um, and right now, because of the um, the nature of the COVID pandemic. Uh, when numbers come down, uh, we like to talk about the fact that we are building a system for six, eight months down the road. When numbers ultimately come down from where they are now, uh, as we all know, uh, having an effective contact tracing program that can respond quickly to outbreaks is gonna be the name of the game. So while we may be seeing widespread failures of the system that the media has been referring to, um, it is fair, obviously, to be thinking about where we will be eight months from now uh, when uh, the numbers lessen. So building this system up has to be an effort that we uh, support. Uh, uh, most health departments have only been at this for four or five months or less. And some of the new resources that have been allocated to public health departments um, are really just starting to get uh, spent. Um, uh, letting contracts, hiring new staff, these are all uh, uh, processes and procedures that take a lot of time uh, to implement. I think what uh, many in the national public health community are looking for as well, uh, uh, mostly our non-governmental uh, colleague folks in Washington, 
is uh, to be looking for uh, uh, heightened national standards and a plan uh, rather than a decentralized approach. Um, uh, CDC has excellent resources on its website for evaluation standards, particularly in contact tracing. Uh, but having some national standards implemented across the country um, is, is something that uh, groups are going to be looking for in the future. Um, last but not least, uh, there has been some very good uh, national studies um, issued around uh, 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 contact tracing uh, coupled with testing. Uh, but we do see the severability in terms of what's really needed at the state and local level. And so, uh, again, this speaks to some of the holes in terms of a national response related to testing and contact tracing. Some of the resources I want to point to um, are very good resources. And for those of you, again, who have downloaded this presentation, these links are embedded here. Resolve to Save Lives has a very good technical uh, tool for uh, for, for starting up contact tracing programs. Um, the ASTO NCSD contact tracing training is listed here. Uh, we're in the process of updating that. There will be modules added to that. Um, Johns Hopkins and NPR have teamed up to be documenting uh, what absent uh, other national databases uh, have teamed up to kind of document what is happening state by state in terms of adding uh, uh, staff um, and capacity within health departments. And then you can see some of these other resources as well um, that are listed. And so just a quick set of acknowledgements. I wanna thank members of our team. I couldn't be prouder of the NCST team in terms of how we pivoted to respond to COVID. Um, Amanda, Aaron, Iman, Leandra, Jennifer, uh, Mary, and Matt, thank you for the work that you've done. And of course, this is how we can be contacted at NCSD. And I see Jonna, so I think my seven minutes are up. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, David. And um, I appreciate you left us with a lot of questions. Um, and now I'm gonna turn to, uh, to Dr. Marcus to have the last formal presentation part of this uh, plenary on sexual health messaging during COVID-19. Hi, um, I am gonna pull up my slides here and then I'm gonna try to give a 15 minute talk in seven minutes. So <laughs> I apologize in advance advance, um, I'm going to talk fast. So I'm going to talk kind of broadly about health messaging during COVID-19 and then bring it to sexual health. I think there, um, there's a lot we can learn from HIV and STIs and the way that we do messaging in our fields um, and, and bringing that to COVID-19 in general and then specifically around sexual health. So our approach generally in March and April was really an abstinence only approach. And I'm talking about social contact, also sexual contact. The message was really just to stay home. And of course, that's not sustainable over a long period of time. And, and people cannot um, abstain from, from sex. They can't abstain from social contact for the most part. This approach doesn't work for substance use either. Um, so, so this cannot really be our, our approach in an ongoing way for this pandemic. And so I want to talk about what our alternative is to abstinence-only messaging for, for social contact and for sexual contact. And I want to uh, talk specifically about the harm reduction framework that we use in sexual health and that um, has really been developed by and for people who use drugs. So I'm going to compare these two models, um, first of all, in terms of risk. In the abstinence only model, we tend to think of risk as binary. Um, you're staying home or you're not having sex outside of your household and you're safe and then everything else you do is unsafe. In contrast, harm reduction really um, conceptualizes risk as a spectrum. Drivers of risk in an abstinence-only model tend to be individual. Um, so individual choice is really seen as, as um, the driver. Whereas in harm reduction, we think about context, and that's something we tend to think about in sexual health as well, um, not just um, the context that drives people's uh, decisions, but also the context that drives their risk, including environmental, structural, um, inequities. Um, and those are all things we need to be considering when we think about um, people's risk and why they make the decisions that they make. Um, kind of corresponding to drivers of risk being individual in the abstinence only model, um, high risk behavior tends to be conceptualized as a personal failure, whereas in the harm reduction model, we tend to think about the unmet need because we're thinking about that broader context. Uh, messaging, likewise, in, abstinent, in the abstinence only approach tends to be moralistic, and I'll talk about that again in a minute, um, whereas harm reduction tends to be compassionate because we're thinking about the unmet needs that people have. And then finally, the expectation and the abstinence only model tends to be 100% risk reduction, because of course risk is binary. 
Whereas in harm reduction, we're thinking pragmatically about how we can help people inch toward a lower risk place that is sustainable for them. So I wanna just briefly mention that shaming and that moralistic messaging has been very prevalent during COVID and not specifically for sexual health, but in general. And these are examples um, of what I'm talking about specifically around masks. And these are tweets, de-identified tweets from um, health professionals with huge followings on Twitter. Um, I think mask wearing at this press conference is a reasonable litmus test for whether or not you're a callous moron. Just ran four miles in a KN95 mask and I'm not hypoxic. You know why? Because I'm a goddamn American and real Americans don't whine like a bunch of little snowflakes. Can you imagine being so insecure that wearing a mask for a little while was a threat to your masculinity? Hashtag wear a damn mask. How many times do I need to remind you that this pandemic ain't over? And so this is an understandable um, frustration that people are communicating. But as sexual health folks, I think when we think about um, these kinds of messages in the context of, let's say, condoms or sexual health messaging in general, we know that this kind of messaging can drive stigma. And so I think we have a, an important role in this pandemic um, to try to preempt stigma and help people see um, how a more compassionate approach can be more effective. Um, in contrast, empathy really builds trust. So I'll just give one quick example. I encourage folks to wear a mask in public, but I don't like masks at all. I don't like seatbelts, helmets, or condoms either. I wear a mask to protect myself and others though. I tried different masks and face shields too. And I know this won't be forever, but yeah, it's not easy. And I think we all know this, this kind of messaging really is gonna help people hear us better when we tell them what our, our public health message is. So taking this um, to sex and the coronavirus, um, I wanna highlight New York City's um, safer sex guidance that they put out in March and then updated several months later as being um, really exemplary in terms of the harm reduction model. And I'll just highlight a few things that jumped out at me in the, the first couple paragraphs of this guidance. First of all, they make the safest option clear. All New Yorkers should stay home as much as possible and minimize contact with others to reduce the spread of COVID-19. This is important because with harm reduction, people often push back and say, well, what you're giving people information about risky behavior and isn't that gonna promote risky behavior? But actually we're making the safest option clear. We're just acknowledging that some risk may happen and we wanna give people tools to reduce um, any potential harms if they do engage in risky behavior. Uh, this, the guidance is clearly non-judgmental. Sex is a normal part of life. Um, they also highlight a spectrum of risk. Um, they offer strategies to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19 during sex. So implicitly acknowledging that some people will have sex. Um, they also acknowledge that, uh, you know, in uh, consistent with the World Health Organization and their definition of both sexual health and health more broadly, it's more than the absence of disease. Decisions about sex and sexuality need to be balanced with personal and public health. And then finally, um, as we heard from Sue Blank, that this was really sex positive messaging, even in the midst of a pandemic. Can you have sex? Yes, here are some tips for how to enjoy safer sex. So what are the key sexual health messages for COVID-19? First of all, you are your safest sex partner. Um, we definitely wanna tell people to avoid sex if they feel sick or, sick or have been exposed. I think the key message that um, I, I think is most important here is minimize the number of partners. And it's the same message for social contact to minimize the, the number of people you have social contact with. Aim for one partner at a time, and that means not just um, group sex versus sex with one individual, but also um, one partner at a time in terms of reducing concurrency. We know that in HIV and STIs, um, that switching back and forth between partners can increase risk in a sexual network. And so the same goes here for COVID-19. And then keep, um, keep up with any strategies that people are using to prevent HIV, STIs, and unintended pregnancy, including PrEP, which is my, um, my own uh, field of interest. And then there are some tips for reducing COVID-19 risk during sex. And I think um, I will just say some of these besides condoms may be a bit less practical. And I think that they should be less of a focus um, because it's best, I think, for our public health messaging to be as pragmatic as possible. But these can definitely be on the table for, for people for whom these might work. So keeping distance, including virtual sex or masturbation, minimizing kissing, using condoms to reduce exposure to saliva and other bodily fluids, minimizing rimming, um, masks uh, to the extent that people are willing to wear masks during sex, and then physical barriers, which had been recommended by the New York City Health Department um, as a potential strategy for reducing droplet contact during sex. And I will highlight that that, um, that created a bit of a media storm, um, which I was very happy to see during these dark times about glory holes being officially recommended for safer sex amid the pandemic. And I'll also note that it, it um, led to the best email I've received in my career from a New York Times reporter who really wanted to understand what was going on there. Walls, holes, sex, need your help. Um, so finally, I wanna just mention one thing that has been um, highlighted less in the sexual health guidance to date, which is uh, around non-judgmental communication. And I think this is really important as, as sexual health people to be normalizing the conversations that people have to have around COVID-19 
and that may have to happen much earlier in a relationship than a conversation around HIV or STIs might. Um, symptoms or exposure may come up, risk on the job or transit, personal vulnerability to the virus, other social distancing that people are doing, including other sex partners, and what's going on in the local community spread. And we want to help normalize these conversations to reduce stigma and normalize them happening not just initially, but on an ongoing basis. And I will just thank um, Dimitri and Oni, who led the development of those guidelines and, um, and the folks who have been giving me input on my um, writing and thinking during the pandemic, and my family, who's been very patient. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Marcus. Um, tremendous work, everybody, and all the uh, panelists. We are at 3.30, um, which is the end, formal end of the panel, but I just wanted to open it up for any, do any of the panelists have one last thing, either a question, a comment, a statement that they would like to make before we formally end the session. Nope. Okay, well, thank you very much. You left us with a tremendous amount of information to think about. And I think um, I, I want to remind everyone that at four o'clock, um, we'll have the, the formal opening plenary, uh, Naked and Afraid, Why We May Need to Disrobe and Expose Flawed Systems, Institutions, and People If We Are Serious About Disrupting STI Epidemics and Disparities in Sexual Health. Um, thank you again for preparing the presentations and, and giving uh, great talks. Thank you.